I am Russell Howard. I am the Behavioral Intervention Team Coordinator and Case Manager here at Angelo State University. The gentleman in the snazzy suit and power tie will introduce himself here when it is his turn to speak. He said, he said, do your introduction, I'll do mine. I said, okay, but I'd surprise him with that. Um, we're here to talk to you about what's bit and what to do when, when you run up against a student of concern. Whether it's faculty, whether it's, uh, whether you're staff, whether you're a student, um, you are at some point in time going to run up against one of the, at least one, if not more, of the things that we're going to talk about uh, this afternoon. So I'll be brief. Um, I will try to give you as much information as possible without shooting you with a fire hose and drowning you, okay? So I'll try to make sure we keep this brief but informative for you. So what is the bit? Obviously, you have a definition on the screen. The behavioral intervention team is composed of staff and faculty and serves to provide appropriate referrals to help students achieve academic success while also paying special attention to the safety and security needs of the members of the Angelo State community. Basically, the bid exists, I say it in kind of a crude manner, and I don't really mean it this way, but as an old grumpy retired Air Force First Sergeant, it's about the only way I know how to say it. I exist and the BIT team exists to make sure that students don't harm themselves or harm others, kill themselves or kill others. That's basically what BIT does. And we do that in a number of ways, uh, which we'll get to here in a moment. But essentially, we're trying to, we, we rely on you as faculty, staff, and students to identify those students who are struggling, uh, whether it be academically, whether it be emotionally, whether it be financially, because all those things can lead to behavioral intervention issues. So the bit, members of the BIT team are uh, my boss, Executive Director of Student Affairs, Dr. Bradley Petty. He's the one that chairs the BIT. Uh, the Assistant Director of Student Conduct, Randall Jenkins, BIT Coordinator Case Manager. Hello. The Director of Counseling Services, the gentleman snazzily dressed to my right. Uh, the ASU Police Department Chief, uh, Chief Adams, as well as Lieutenant Mark West. And then Housing and, Res Housing and Residential Programs, excuse me, Director Tracy Baker is on there as well. Uh, we have some auxiliary members that consult when needed. Uh, Dallas Swafford, who is the Student Disability Services Director. Um, we also uh, coordinate with financial aid when necessary, human resources and Curtis Neal when necessary. And obviously, Title IX, that slide needs to be updated. Kaylin Coffey is no longer with Angelo State University. Um, Milan, and I can't remember her last name, is now the, the assistant to Michelle Boone. So we'll make those changes. But Michelle is your point of contact for anything Title IX related. I will stop here for just a moment and let you know that um, most all Title IX cases have a bit component. Um, because whenever uh, an individual undergoes some sort of sexual assault, uh, sexual harassment, something, it, it leaves emotional scars, emotional wounds. Um, mental health issues, and so a lot of times that will roll over into a BIT issue. However, we separate the incidents. We keep BIT in BIT and Title IX in Title IX to protect the, the, the student or the staff or the faculty member who has uh, filed that Title IX complaint. So here are some of the types of referrals that you can make to BIT. Academic support. Michelle, raise your hand. Michelle Reed back there is one of my most trusted uh, resources along with Mark in dealing with uh, behavioral inter uh, intervention problems. And that's because if a student is having struggles in one class, chances are they're struggling in another class. Um, and typically she gets, what, six, seven emails a week from me asking about different students. Um, and so when I get a report that comes in about a student, regardless, I almost always reach out to her and say, hey, can you run an academic status check? So if you are faculty and you see Michelle send you, hey, we've received an email from the Office of Student Affairs asking us to check um, the academic progress of student X, I will probably guarantee you 99.9% .9 of the time that came from me asking her to check on these people because I want to I want to know if a student's struggling in other classes because oftentimes you as faculty will have information that this faculty member doesn't have and that I don't have and we can connect that loop and figure out what this student needs. Now sometimes they refuse help. It's unfortunately it's just a fact. It is, it, it is what it is. We, we, we reach out, we try to get to them, and sometimes they just don't want the help. Um, sometimes they, as Michelle can attest, sometimes they just drop off the face of the earth. Her and I have done several visits where they just didn't answer the door in housing. They just didn't want to talk to us. So, but we try to make that effort and get to them. 
substance abuse, uh, classroom and behavioral issues, uh, injury or illness, a student passes out in your class or a student throws up in class or a student um, has a panic attack, whatever it may be in class. Uh, sexual assault and harassment, although that does end up in the Title IX office first to determine if there's a Title IX component. Student hospitalizations. If you have a student that contacts you, or you know of a student, maybe that's not your student, you're just having any friends with them or acquaintances with them, and you know they've been in the hospital, please let us know because we, in the, in the Office of Student Affairs, we send out an, an email uh, letter, as it were, to all of the professors saying, hey, this student was hospitalized, for, or was hospitalized from this date to this date. Please work with them to, for any makeup assignments. And that, that way, you know that they're not just lying to you that they were in the hospital. You know that, because we verify that fact that they have indeed been hospitalized. And we send that out to you. And uh, as a faculty member, it's certainly up to you what you decide to do, but most all faculty will work with a student with a medical issue. Uh, students in distress. This is a big one when you see them, um, you see a student that's really bubbly, upbeat for like a month, and then all of a sudden, this point in the semester, they're just, you know, at the bottom. Uh, they fell off the mountain, emotionally speaking. You know something's going on. File, if you, if most assuredly, talk to them, but also file a report so we can kind of reach out to some of the other uh, professors and whatnot to see if see if they're having the same struggles in those classes that you witness in yours. Uh, obviously, suicidal ideations and attempts. Um, anything that, 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 that you think or that you hear that could lead to a suicidal attempt, ideation, please let us know. Um, I, will, I will try to get with you and talk to you about the situation, the case, just to kind of get some further information. Obviously, when you file a report, you can't always type in everything that happened in that conversation because you just don't remember it. But when I call you, perhaps something else will come up or you'll make a statement that'll give me some insight because I've already talked to, say, another professor and I can put those two together and we can try to uh, get help for that student. Threatening behavior. I want to stop right there and say this. Anytime you feel threatened in a classroom, you can feel free to call UPD. Please, if, if, there, if you have a student that is acting in a threatening manner, call UPD, period, dot. We've had this happen. This is more of a conduct than a bid issue, but um, we had a fight in the classroom. Professor, faculty, if I remember correctly, don't, 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 don't um, hold my feet to the fire on this or swear, make me swear to it under oath. The professor didn't do anything, just let it go on. If you have a situation like that, please contact UPD, let them know. Even if they carry it on outside, call UPD, let UPD respond, and so that we can put that, have that on record, because who knows what may be going on. We may have a couple other reports from that student concerning threatening or violent behavior, and, and it could be a marker for us to say, okay, wait a minute, let's look into this. Bobby's got some serious issues going on. We need to figure out what's up with Bobby, and is he, in fact, a hazard to the ASU community? Because as we saw on that other slide, the, the focus is to make sure every one of us are safe, right? and to make sure we keep our students safe and out of harm's way. Um, we, we've read ad nauseum about school shootings, and I'm not going into that right now or at all during this briefing, but we want to prevent that kind of thing from actually taking place here at Angelo State University. We don't want that. We don't want to be on the news. We don't want any of that nonsense. So I rely, and Mark relies, and Dr. Petty relies on all of y'all to get that information. We can't keep track of 10,000 plus students. We, we have y'all to help us out with that. If in doubt, refer or consult. You can always call us. 2047 is the Office of Student Affairs. My direct line is 5461. Um, that, I work in uh, Office of Student Affairs Suite 112 there in the University Center. So you can always come by anytime. Dr. Petty, myself, Randall Jenkins, Dallas Swafford, we'll be happy to talk to you at any point in time. Um, a lot of people will call Dallas. Um, asking about disability stuff and it will open up a, a, a bid issue that I can get involved with and help that student out. So if you're in doubt, please refer or consult. Now, I almost forgot to mention this. Your classroom, if you're faculty, your classroom is your classroom. How you run it is completely up to you. We are not trying to get involved in that. Things like talking on cell phones in classes, that's, that's, your, that's your business, that's your classroom, that's your um, that's your issue. You handle that as you see fit. We're just trying to uh, 
things like you know the depression, the, the emotional distress, the violent behaviors, that's what we're trying to identify. So please, we're not trying to take over a classroom uh, and dictate to what to do in the classroom. And my good friend Mark, yay. Let's not do that. Let's not do that. <laughs> you recognize someone in your world, your sphere of influence is struggling with any of these things. We're going to have a chat with them, right? Can we do that? Again, there's no, this is obviously not in many of your job descriptions, but you're here, you took time out of your day, and I'm sure it wasn't just for some chips and salsa, right? Um, that's probably my worst, my worst meal I offered, but anyway. <laughs> so discuss the situation with your supervisor. Again, maybe it's, it's always best to talk it out. Let's get a couple of sets of ears on this thing. Let's figure out a best course of action, especially if you're a faculty or staff. There may be some protocols or procedures that you need to be aware of to develop a game plan. Again, if, if this is a situation that you feel like could be volatile, we would certainly want to involve police or additional authorities because we would never want you to walk into a situation that's going to cause you harm. Okay? Um, Russ already offered this. I'm not going to give you my direct extension, sorry, because I have a lot of times I have counseling appointments and I don't want my phone to ring during a session, but um, we are available. My, my best thing is email. If you email me, I should get back with you in 48 hours, or I said I would resign, so that's a pretty big thing. I'm, don't hold me to it, but um, we're, we're happy to talk to you and say, hey, what's going on? Here is a, a good way to handle it. I know uh, I had a, a couple times professors would email me and say, this student emailed me this. What do you think about it? And it was basically the student, the professor actually felt threatened and the student was doing some stuff. And I, I just offered the suggestion, like, maybe the student just wants to be heard. Maybe you could invite him to your office and have a, a discussion. And, and they took the advice and it actually worked out well. It was just a big misunderstanding because as we all know, tone on emails is hard to read through and we all can get up in a flurry over such things. So if you, you know, do these first few steps, you don't need to do them, but if you already feel comfortable with the student, with the situation, um, of course address them in private. No one wants to be outed in the midst of 14 other classmates sitting around them. Uh, ask them to come to your office at a, at a private time. I always tell this terrible story. Um, <coughs> I, was at, <coughs> excuse me, I was at Ram Roundup and, and this very well-meaning student she brought up a person who was uh, transgender right in front of, I was eating with all the other faculty and staff at the table and she brought the student up in front of the whole breakfast table and said, hey, I just wanted you to introduce you to Mark in case you ever need counseling in the future. Good heart, not a good time, right? So it was address it in private. Okay, so share your concerns, communicate care. So you can do this with words, with tones, with nonverbals, right? Um, one, this is really lame, but one of the things they teach you in counseling classes is go like this when someone's talking. Nod your head. Acknowledge what they're saying. Say, I'm tracking with you. We all can do that. Let's do it. Let's practice. Hey, I get it. You guys are hearing me. That's wonderful. <laughs> but you can also communicate care through validation. So if someone says to me, hey, I am stressed out. I have three tests tomorrow. My parents just decided to, to get a divorce. Um, and I don't know what to do. So some of us might want to like fix that problem or say, go get them. But one of the best things you can do initially is say, wow, that sounds like a lot of stress in your plate. So what, what, what are you doing by saying that? I mean, you're really just parroting back what they say or maybe changing the words subtly, but you're saying, I get you, you're stressed. Does that make sense? So validate their concerns. Another way to put this is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you're not sharing that care, they're not going to listen to your advice or your fixes. Okay. Um, identify specific observations. So again, let them know what you've seen. I've noticed that you've been coming to all my classes late, or I've noticed you haven't been showing up for your stuff, or I've noticed that it would be helpful if you took a shower every once in a while. Right? I shouldn't joke about that, but I thought it was sort of funny. Um, but be specific. I mean, every, I, I think the best policy is just to be direct. Now, there's going to be some people who are just naturally direct. I can let you know what, what, my, what my issue with, it, with you is. And some people are going to be more like, I want to develop a relationship before I can get there. And, and both of them are great. But know who you are, and that will help frame your discussion. 
Uh, know your limitations. Again, most of you probably are not trained counselors. And so if you get into a situation that feels like above your head, like, whoa, you're talking about disorganized speech here, and I have no idea what the heck to do. Well, that's where we refer. We offer resources. We brought some resources here today, um, so please take them if you'd like to. But let us know how we can help. And file a student's concern report. Russ is going to hit this later. All right, so what not to do. I've kind of hit some of these as I was talking about what to do, but do not immediately try to solve or fix the problem. So if you finally get the courage up, because most people don't like to reach out for help, do they? It's, it's not a human trait that we, that we gravitate towards. So if someone finally said, okay, I'm going to go tell my professor he seems cool, and then they lay out this 18-page stressor filled rant of no one likes me, I'm not getting along, these classes are way harder than I could. If you start going, okay, let's do this here, let's do this here, let's do this here, do you feel like that will be received well? Maybe, maybe not, but again, if we, if we could start with the validating the concerns first, and then let's say, well, how can we, ha how can we work on this? What, what can we do? And again, I, I can't sit up here and tell a professor or a staff member you need to give students grace. I mean, that's your, that's your prerogative, it's your job, but I would say most people respond better with, what's this saying, honey? I don't even know. Do you, you guys know what I'm getting at? Honey and, honey and vinegar. Yes. Okay. Some people, I, I hear these conversations all the time, like two people are having a conversation, they're going back and forth. I went to Austin this weekend. Oh, really? I went to Germany this weekend. Oh, really? I ate some grapes. So I, I don't know. It's not really connecting. So if you also say something like, I know exactly what you're going through. Why is that a dangerous thing to say when someone just dumps a, a bunch of stress on you? Yes. It's minimizing. You really don't know exactly what you're going through, and you really don't know exactly how they feel. So if you take that away from them, are they going to trust you with further stuff? Probably not. So again, better things to say is, wow, I'm sorry. Even if you have to just say, I'm sorry. That's really stressful. That's really tough. Or I can see why you've been so stressed out. Um, of course, we should never say things like this, get over it, toughen up, pull your stuff together. Um, that can fly some places, but probably not in a situation like this. Um, be distracted. So we all have those things called cell phones, and I know it's very easy to pull them out of our pocket and look at them, especially in a time like this where maybe we even feel stressed out. But one of the greatest values that counselors can give people is that we give someone an undivided attention, active listening. How many times in life do you really get that? Not very often. We also, tr again, try your best to be non-judgmental. Um, that's a gift to someone. If I can trust someone with my crud and don't fear that they're, they're going to judge me, that, that's huge. So again, that, that, that might be your whole role in this situation, and then get them to the right person. Again, don't take the situation too lightly. Um, even if the student has been dramatic in the past, or maybe they chronically have these problems, Again, do I want to feel good about being able to sleep tonight and not worry that I didn't do all that I could? Or do I want to just blow it off and be like, okay, they're just being them again. Um, don't fail to follow up with the student. Again, we don't expect you to like tail them or big brother them. But it would be awesome if after, even after you turn in a report that you could go back to them at some point and say, hey, how you been feeling since we talked last? Um, I hit that one. Any questions about what not to do? Okay. I mean, I would always ask them. I think I actually, I mean, in counseling, like it's pretty rare that you would touch someone, but I had a, a young lady yesterday, I said, you, would you like a hug? Just at the end of the session, just because she was highly emotional. And I gave her like a little nice side hug, but it was very meaningful. So I would never touch without asking. But I think it's appropriate to ask, depending on your role and your comfort level. Okay, good question. All right, so this is like new to the presentation. This is, so we want to give you an idea 
of think about a, someone who is who is an identified person. Maybe they ha they've said or they social media have some level of suicidal ideation. So that person is right in front of you. Okay. So I want you to think about this flow chart. If you want to take a picture of it, you can, even though it's a little big for the screen. But maybe we can put it down a little bit. Okay. So we want to find out the answer to this question. Is the student in imminent danger? Imminent danger means they are a very strong likelihood to kill themselves if there is no intervention. In fact, probably it's going to happen. So if, the, if after talking to them, or we don't know, if we don't know if it's during business hours, we want you to refer them immediately to counseling services. Business hours are 8 to 5. Okay? Um, we al always want you to file an incident report. And if it's, after, if it's after hours, give them an ASU crisis helpline, which we have tons of those cards right there. We also have little handy dandy counseling services cards that you can hand to someone if, if you want to refer them. Um, if you're not certain, this means QPR, which is our suicide prevention training. So if you want to drill down way, way deeper on what we've been talking about today as far as warning signs, um, I would recommend attending that training. We do it every semester. Um, but we need to ask some of those questions. Like, what's going on? Are you feeling upset? Are you having suicidal thoughts? Um, if we know for sure that they're in imminent danger, we want to call the police. If it's on campus, if it's off campus, we want to call 911. And we want to file an incident report no matter what. So this, you don't really need to know this, but this is the process of what happens after the police are called. Um, if we're still uncertain after we, we ask them some questions, if they're deemed suicidal, we'll go back up to call campus police. If they're not suicidal, we'll get them to the counseling center or we'll give them a crisis helpline. I know this is, you, you may not need to know this. We just want to throw this in there. Any questions about that? Is it pretty simple? You might, uh, if, if we do. Okay. Yeah, I think that that's a, a prime concern. And the research actually shows, though, that when we ask the question, it does not suggest it to them. If they're thinking about it, they're already thinking about it. You're, you're not going to, like, push them over the line by asking them. And, and most students or people, when asked, they feel such a sense of relief that someone actually cared enough to go that deep with them. So I would say always ask when in doubt. If you can't ask, get them to us. Good question. All right. We, how are we doing on time? We're doing well. All right, you guys want to watch a role play <clears throat> of what this might look like, a conversation. All right, Russ. Can you be my volunteer? Oh, sure. Yes, Mark. Yes, sir. Sure. No problem, sir. OK. Hey. Let's stand in the middle. Go. Hey, Russ. So I've noticed um, you've now been coming to class, and you've been really doing hideous work. I'm really disappointed in your behavior. What do you got to say for yourself? Well, nothing. You pretty much said it all. Why should I care? I don't know. But I mean, if you want to get a good, good grade in this class, you'll figure it out. Right now, this class is the least of my worries. I don't give a crap what you think. OK. You seem a little hostile. I'm a little scared. But if you, if you don't want to. I'm not hurting you. If you don't want to waste your time. I haven't moved yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh, Mark. Uh, oh. Good God, man. Stop. <laughs> well. I mean, maybe I'm not the person to give you help, but you could probably try somewhere else on campus. I mean, you could always drop the class, too, because it doesn't seem like you care that much. Well, you know what? Maybe I will go do that. Thanks. Okay. Really appreciate that. Anytime. Just uh, remember, it's your life. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was obviously our bad role play, right? Like, what not to do? Not, not just the laugh thing. But what did you see there? I wasn't? He was scary. <laughs> what Old else? Old and fat, I'm not scary. He's, he's frantic with his hideous work. 
I did. That's bad language. Maybe not, yeah. Is that what you're going to say? Yeah, definitely. That's pretty easy to see. All right, let's maybe we can try again. You want to try again? Yes. Okay. Hey, Russ. So I just wanted to you know take you aside for a minute and have a little chat. I noticed that um, some of your work has been not as good as it used to be, and uh, I'm a little concerned about you. Is anything going on? Yeah, got a got a lot of issues. Um, just come up over the last couple of weeks and. Just haven't been able to focus on the class that well. Just, uh, you know, just things happen. It's life, and mm. so yeah, haven't been able to focus very well. So focus has been hard. And there's been a lot going on. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 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 Is there anything I can do to kind of help you work through that? Well, I, you know, I don't know. Is there someone? Is there a certain agency? Someone I could talk to? Maybe. I mean, I, I know you're not. You're not normally a counselor that I know of. I mean, is there someone that I could talk to? There is. I mean, I'm glad you came to me first because I think it's, it's important to reach out for help. Um, yeah, we actually have a great counseling center on campus. Um, I know some people over there. I just talked to this dude, and he's not the worst person in the world. I think you might like him. Uh, do they have, like, walk-ins, or do I have to wait, like, six months for an appointment? or? I mean, what's the process for getting an appointment over there? Yeah, they're, um, every day from 9 to 3, you can just walk over to the university clinic across the street, or you can call ahead and they can schedule you an appointment. Do you have the number, a card, maybe somebody I can call to make that appointment? I do. Let me go grab one for you. All right. But I also, I mean, if you're willing, uh, I could walk you right over there. All right. Let's do that. Okay. Can't hurt. Okay. That was too easy, man. You said make it easy this time. Okay. Okay. Last time I made him drag it out of me. This time he says, no, it's too easy. Come on. Okay. i got to find that happy medium. What did you guys see? Anything good? You could see in his demeanor whenever you approached him from the beginning. Okay. The threat played out. Okay. Anything else? No beration. <laughs> One important point that he brought out, I'm hoping all y'all caught, is the walk-in hours at the counseling clinic because it is a real concern from students when they come to me, particularly asking about counseling, the time frame to get an appointment. And that's when I bring up there's walk-in hours um, till 3 o'clock Monday through Friday. So um, that's a really important point to know if you want to get a student to counseling. There is walk-ins. Um, they have one on standby, correct? Yep, up, every hour. Every hour up until 3 o'clock. Up through, excuse me, 3 o'clock Monday through Friday. Sorry, didn't mean to jump your chain. No, and if it's 347, we're not going to turn someone away who's in a crisis. So those are our boundary laden hours. But obviously if you're in a situation where you need to get someone over there, we're, we're never going to turn anyone away. The other thing though about that too is the best referral is actually walking someone over there because then you, kn you know for your peace of mind that they actually came. Sometimes students are so freaked out about going to get counseling because there's such stigma s surrounding it still. Um, but also you can give, you can actually come into the session if the student wants you to. I don't, I don't know if you all want to, but it's a possibility. But it also helps us because it can give us additional information about what's going on and what you're seeing. And then other times, I don't know if you believe this or not, but some students will tell you all one thing and then they'll tell us something completely different. So. Like maybe they share with you, hey, I'm really thinking about jumping off a bridge tonight. And then they come to us knowing that, well, they may or may not know, but we can hospitalize them and make sure that they're in a safe environment for a short period of time. So that, that's why it's also helpful for you to walk them over. So any other things about the role play? So what if it's after hours? What if it's after hours? Ooh, I got young again. My voice cracked. Um, as far as like what to do, like where to, where to go? showed her on the map where y'all at, okay. 
but they're closed right now, but go over there. They'll be glad to talk to you. You can get in with a counselor and they'll be glad to help you with your stress and you know, give you some coping mechanisms and such. And also this? And, okay. I, I don't think I have any of those. I'll okay. Get some more of those. But I mean, it was after hours. So yeah. I knew y'all wouldn't be there, so there was no use walking her over. Sure. So if you, if you call the crisis helpline <laughs> after hours, um, they ha know our ASU and San Angela resources so well that if, if their student needs hospitalization, they can actually do it all right through the phone. Like they'll organize through our campus police and our mental health deputies in town. So in, a, in that situation, I mean, that would be another option that you have. And if, especially if it's a suicidal situation, I mean, um, we can also be get gotten a hold of through campus police, but I mean, I would, I would in involve campus police at that point. Like if they said, I'm seriously considering dying right now. She was just crying and stressed. Sure. Uh, feeling, feelings of being overwhelmed from what I could tell, but she didn't seem suicidal, but um, sure. just, when it comes to coping mechanisms and help. Perfect. I'm not going to share this story with you guys because I know that you're in the investigation of suicide in both of your areas. And then um, the successful, unfortunately, we have a lady who has died. And when I heard the police and interviewed the people to find out why they were so rash and suicidal by the age of five days, one reason never takes you lightly is the failure of a person to, to take them to the police. There are a lot of issues where people wanted to commit suicide because they weren't getting A's in three classes in their high school or different schools. They weren't top of their class anymore when they came to college or quite a bit good, more difficult than they were before. So stress can be very things that you and I may think, well, that's just something for the next level, a little more difficult. Some people don't take it that easy. It really impacts their lives. It changes their lives because they don't want to go back home as a failure. They always thought that. They need to be aware of those things. Also, it's entertainment they want. This was this was very, very interesting case. I mean, all kinds of levels. But one of the big things was really uncovered was the need for constant and need for professorial support out there when I did the investigation was because the failures, uh, they had to learn languages, for example, Russian, in a very short number of time. And they're not able to do it. And they're just not able to do it at that level. And they don't want to go back home and be kicked out again. Say, I'm now a failure. And that first time in life they've ever experienced failure. Literally, first time in life that they've ever experienced something that wasn't completely, I could do this and I could going on with that, cultural issues, but it could be a, the stuff that's from those specific countries. The song were very supportive of people that were failing and saying that they had others were, well, you don't know what you're doing, so we'll just let you fall off the scale, so we're not worried about you. So the cultural learning experience, too, there. So there's, there's but I'm correct, your point, your remark is the stress level of an individual is not, don't equate that ever to something that you would find not stressful and not Excellent point. Perception is our reality. So it's not about us. All right, I want to share one real quick thing. I'm going to turn it back over to Russ. This is a clipboard of, of the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Uh, if you want one of these, I have a box in that little buggy. I can't believe I said buggy. It's the first time I ever said buggy. <laughs> I'm referring to a cart. Um, more of a wagon. Okay, let's go with the wagon. <laughs> have you ever wished you were dead and you go to sleep? Yes, no. Based on how they answer, it will take you to the next question. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying like, let's go and ask everyone in our lives if they're suicidal, but this is a fantastic tool that you can keep with you and, and ask questions. Um, have you ever actually ha had thoughts of killing yourself? If yes, go to question three. If no, skip to question six. So if you want one, please take them. They're free. Um, they're great tools. If anything, they're a good reminder um, of what questions to ask. So let's turn it back over. So I will say this, piggybacking on what uh, Sam said, um, I have to walk a very fine line here at Angela State for the next four years because my youngest daughter is now a student here um, as a freshman. She is struggling somewhat adjusting from high school to college. So I've already caught myself saying to my wife, I cannot believe she's struggling with that. This is not that hard. I haven't said it to her, but I've said it to my wife.
in, in our conversation. And the reason I say that is I graduated in May of 17 from here. I was on the 50-year uh, bachelor's program. So I graduated at 50 <laughs> with my bachelor's program. There was 24 and a half years of other work in there, first career in there. Uh, but I have to realize that I have a whole lot more life experience behind me and so it's not a struggle for me. It wasn't that. Now the master's program is kicking my behind. I'll be perfectly bluntly honest with you. I am not doing well in that. But what Sam said is so very irrelevant. It, it, in, and, and based on my previous career, it's very easy for me to get the mindset, look, suck it up. This isn't difficult. And I, can't, I, have to, I have to place that persona aside and be caring and kind and understand that not everybody can adapt to stuff like I can. Shoot, there's some that can adapt to stuff that I can't adapt to in my life. So um, I have to understand that. And that's a very good point that Sam said. So with all that being said, how do I, so you keep talking about these reports, file a report, file a report, file a report. How do I do that? Well, there you go. Uh, visit angelo.edu slash incident form. If you cannot remember that, if you go to the upper right corner in the search bar at angelo.edu and type an incident report, it will take you to a bunch of links and the very first one will get you to the online reporting form. Um, and and it's, it's very simple, it's very self-explanatory. You, you, if you don't know how to file the report, select bit. If, if, if you don't know what it falls under, just select bit. And if, when it comes in, it comes into Randall Jenkins and he then assigns it. If it's Title IX, he'll assign it to Michelle Boone. If it's bit, he'll assign it to me. If it's conduct, he'll assign it to himself. Uh, but always, if, if in doubt, just mark it bit and we will, we will get it assigned to the right person and follow up on it and see what's going on. So what happens after I file the report? Um, it goes into our conduct uh, uh, record system known as Maxient. So if you ever hear us call it a Maxient report, same thing as an incident report. Sometimes I, I get carried away because I'm in Maxient every day for eight hours a day and I just refer to it as a Maxient. It's the same thing as an incident report. The BIT coordinator, this guy, will reach out to faculty to determine students' performance in class through the help of my Com uh, comrade in crime back there, Michelle Reed, she will help me determine is this student struggling in other classes. Um, I will also reach out to housing to see how stu student conducts themselves in a the particular housing area. Folks, most of the bit reports, a lot of, I won't say most, a lot of them come from housing obvi for obvious reasons. That's where they spend most of their time. They spend a, a small amount of time in class, the rest of the time on campus, in housing, whatnot. So I'll reach out to them, talk to them. Uh, also reach out to other agencies as needed to determine the severity of the issue. Sometimes UPD, hey, have you seen any reports on this student? Um, typically I already know because I'll have already seen the reports. I see all the police reports that come in. Now this, this third bullet, I want to, uh, I don't always get back with the reporting party. Sometimes I get sidetracked. Now some in here I do know that I will call you back and talk to you um, when you file a report. But if I don't and you really want to know what's happening, please contact me. I will tell you what I can. Some things I may not be able to tell you because there may have been some things come up during while we're working out the case that I can't discuss with you. And I will tell you that there's just some things I can't tell you right now um, because it potentially could have turned into a Title IX case. Potentially it could have turned into a student conduct slash criminal case. Um, so just be aware if, if I I have been trying to get better at following up with the report with the folks who file the report. But if I don't, you really want to know, please don't hesitate to call me back, email me something, and I will respond with, with what I can tell you. Um, stand, and that goes back to standards of confidentiality. We do have to maintain those, FERPA, et cetera. So case study, do we have time for these? No. Okay. Case study number one. Student turns in a paper that has a disturbing drawing on it that could possibly signify a suicidal or homicidal ideation. The paper is given to a teaching assistant to grade. You, as the te teaching assistant, notice the drawing. I can't speak. What do you do? This is audience participation time. What do you do? Huh? Okay. Sam? Report it. Anybody else? Y'all are missing one part. This, that's, the, that's the twist in this particular one. Obviously, it's based on a real, probably based on a real incident. Anywhere on there, does it say whose paper it is? So say the paper has no name on it. What do you do then? Right? 
But what should you mm, try to do first? Bingo. So this report comes in about this paper, right? And so the bit coordinator who has been on the job maybe three months goes, oh, I'm gung-ho, I'm going to get this done and fine, and runs down a student, and guess what? It was the wrong freaking student. There was no name on the paper, did not notice that very, at the very first. There was no identifying marks on the paper, did not notice that. And so good old Russell V. Howard caused a lot of drama with a student that was completely and utterly innocent and a great student. And so then I had to go, and it was, and both of these individuals happened to be in the athletic department. So I had to go fall on my sword in front of one of the coaches and say, look, I'm sorry, I, this was my mistake, my fault. So when you file a report, try to make sure you have all the details you can when you file the report. Again, if you don't, that's fine. Give us what you have and we will try to run it down the rest of the way. So please always um, try to identify the student if you can, and, uh, and if you can't, then we'll try to take it from there. Case study number two, you receive a report about a student who is expressing disturbing behavior by removing himself from his circle of friends at various times. What do you do? Obviously, uh, Mark talked about this earlier. What do you do? Everybody go, report it. Say report it. There you go. See, uh, but but what else could you do? We obviously we're going to report it, but what else could you do potentially? Right. This comes into a play with a lot of student organizations uh, and, and, and staff and faculty advisors to student organizations. Bobby's been a part of this organization for six months and now all of a sudden Bobby's not been to the last three meetings, for example. How do you deal with that? Pull them aside. Hey, man, anything going on? What's, what's happening? I know you haven't made the meetings. Did you get a job? Are you just not able to make it? And then invariably the truth will come out. They, they, will, they will identify the issue to you. Um, sometimes by their non-responses they, they will identify the issue and you'll be able to pick up on it. So good answer. Study number three. After a class, a student shows you a Twitter post from an absent student in your class. Don't you all love social media? The post shows the underage student partying and also cutting a tattoo on their arm. What do you do? First thing you, there you go, see, y'all are getting the hang of it now. Uh, but, but what else could you possibly do in this situation? Cutting's a big issue right now. I mean, it's, it's a big thing. Maybe talk to the Exactly. That's a good point. Or if they're wearing short sleeves and you notice marks that haven't been there before, ask. It's never wrong to ask the question, hey, are you okay? I've noticed there's some marks on you. You know, anything, anything going on in your life? Anything that maybe we can talk about? Sometimes they'll say no. Sometimes they'll open up to you. It won't hurt to ask. There's always a stigma about asking the question, and we, we talk about it in the QPR training a lot. Um, so always don't be afraid to ask questions. When do I call the police? Any answers? <laughs> Anytime you feel threatened or you feel it's necessary. I will tell you this, the UPD will never, ever chastise you for making a call that didn't need to be made. They will always err on the side of caution. And let's be honest, UPD most of the time is not that overwhelmed with work. They do great work, but they, do, they, they, are, they are waiting for you to call them. I, I will tell you that. I, I call Orlando Villarreal, the investigating detective, a lot and just bounce stuff off of him. And invariably, unless he's at lunch, he's in his office ready to answer the call. So feel free to call them anytime you have a question. If you feel threatened, please don't hesitate to call them. Um, I would rather you call them for uh, an overreaction than not call them in an underreaction and then something happened in your classroom because you didn't call. You want to talk about resources? Okay. Well, all righty then. <laughs> Try the veal. He'll be here all week. So here are, here are your resources. You can find these online. Again, remember 2047 or 5461. Please feel free to call me anytime you have a question. Whatever, whether it be BIT, whether it be student conduct, I will get you to the right, if it's not BIT, I will get you connected to the right individual to answer your questions. If it's academic misconduct, I'm going to send you right over to Dr. Petty. 
I try not to deal with academic misconduct. That's not my ball game. That's his call. So, but uh, call me at any time. I'll get you pointed in the right direction. And I think that's it. And finally, a bunch of we got some crisis helpline cards. Anytime, please refer the student to the crisis helpline. Um, it's always a good starting point. And then from there, um, they'll get them, if necessary, they'll get someone out to evaluate the student or point them in the right direction.